John, it's good to be here with you. Nice um, to see you again, Dana. Very interesting book you've written. Thank you. So I wanted to start um, in the beginning. That's probably the easiest way to go. Can you just um, tell me why you decided to join the CIA? Well, it was uh, 1975. Uh, I had been out of law school for about three years. I, uh, I had a, a, a good job, a good entry-level job in the Treasury Department as a lawyer, actually, in the Customs Service, which is part of Treasury at that point. And as I say, it was a good job, but you know, the, I found the, um, the um, atmosphere, the bureaucracy of Treasury, stultifying. I mean, in retrospect, I was you know, young, ambitious, and I was just restless. And about at the same time, the church committee hearings were, were being televised. And as you know, these were the first real set of congressional hearings that uh, exposed CIA activities, misadventures, follies from the, from the 50s and 60s. It was chaired by Senator Frank Church from Idaho. And like it was you know, big chunks of it were being televised, and uh, I believe on C-SPAN, if I'm not mistaken. But you know, I was watching this, and I knew nothing about CIA. I knew no, no one in CIA. In those days, CIA had no visibility at all. But it just occurred to me as I'm watching all these all these tales of, of CIA uh, uh, <coughs> adventures uh, that if um, if CIA didn't have lawyers, and I had no idea whether they did or not, but it occurred to me that they might need some now. <laughs> so I just I just applied, really, it was a shot in the dark. And they might need some new ones, because there was some wrongdoing that was under yeah, the committee. Yeah, 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 as you know, that's a phenomenon. Whenever, I found this actually pattern repeated throughout my career, whenever CIA would get itself into some sort of pickle or flap, uh, the cry would go out is that CIA needs more lawyers. So I was actually, I didn't know at the time, but I was hired in that first wave of hmm. uh, new lawyers. New lawyers so, yeah. so believe it or not, pe people still are confused about why the CIA is different than any other agency of the U.S. government. So just if you could summarize, why do we need a CIA and whose control is the CIA under? Yeah. Well, of course, the CIA is a, you know, a secret intelligence organizations you know, been in existence since 1947. As I say, it's, it's, its very presence uh, was shrouded in sort of mystery uh, for, for its first, what, 20, 25 years. So, um, and of course it acquired this, this mystique um, uh, over the years via, you know, the James Bond right. novels and movies and all of that. But it is, uh, I mean, you know, in essence, it is it is uh, unique uh, among among uh, federal departments in that you know one it operates almost totally in secret, and two it 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 is really a, a an instrument uh, of the president, uh, and that has always been uh, the case. The president is always the master. I, I mentioned in the book that that you know presidents and I served under seven during my time. I mean, each come to view it as sort of their personal pop stand. They can direct it to do things in secret. They don't have to. They don't have to worry about the normal congressional appropriations process. And uh, you know, it's a it's a convenient and uh, attractive and sometimes overly seductive um, uh, uh, tool in the uh, president's foreign policy uh, arsenal. So, it's always been. And I think it will continue to be. Uh, you know, t there have been times over the years after certain scandals, over you know debacles, that the cry goes out that CIA is going to be abolished. Or it'll, it'll never happen because any president, regardless of party per political persuasion, is going to want to have that CIA at his disposal. And it can do things that other agencies mm. are not allowed to do overseas. Like it can break the laws of countries overseas in order to do what it needs to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but CIA. I mean, CIA. In, in CIA, we can't break U.S. laws, but you know, espionage, spy stuff. When mm -hmm. you get right down to it, is violative of international law. And of course, all nations have intelligence services, and you know, are keenly aware of that. So it, you know, everybody sort of does it, and it's sort of implicitly understood. So yeah, CIA um, uh, can can do things that a normal federal agency uh, 
couldn't do. The key thing is, of course, not to get caught or not to screw something up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, you know, what I found surprising about your book was um, your your role and and how much responsibility you were given and how how many times people just really depended on you to to do something to make a decision that they couldn't make or they didn't want to make i wanted to go back to the cold uh, to the cold war actually and and yuri uh, nasenko and you tell a story about him if you could put the story in context describe <coughs> a little bit but then your visit with him and what your mission was and how that went yeah. which okay i'll try to make i'll try to truncate <laughs> this um Yuri Nisenko was a defector from, from the Soviet Union. He, defe he was a KGB apparatchik, really. And he uh, defected to the CIA station in Moscow in early, uh, I believe it was February of 1964, which of course was only, what, four months after the Kennedy assassination, three months. Mm -hmm. And during the Cold War, of course, CIA Defectors from the KGB were considered gold. Uh, CIA has long had a defector program to try to attract them, try to, I mean, it's a huge, sometimes vexing, but a, a huge important account the CIA always has been. So here it was, this guy, Nosenko, literally walked in. I mean, he wasn't, you know, found, I mean, he wasn't. Recruited. Yeah. Was. And, um, you know, like a lot of defectors, he had baggage. Um, uh, he was a heavy drinker, uh, possibly an embezzler of KGB funds, so he was no saint. Uh, but he came, and he not only fell into the agency's laps, uh, he uh, allowed us how he, um, among other things, had had access to the KGB file of Lee Harvey Oswald. Of course, you know, at the time that was huge. And, uh, and basically what, is, what, he, what he said was, uh, that the KGB never had any connection with Oswald while he was in Russia. Uh, Which is not exactly what they were hoping to hear. Well, you know. It's hard to I, prove a negative. They were is, sort of hoping yeah. to hear that there was. Yeah, yeah. Keep in mind, Dan, I, you know, this is 1964. I'm old, but I wasn't. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was, it, I was in high school then, so I wasn't on any direct. Right. Uh, yeah, I think there were some. Mm -hmm obviously different schools of thought because some of the CIA hierarchy took him at his word. Others, most notably a legendary CIA character named James Jesus Angleton, who was head of counterintelligence at the time, was convinced that this Nosenko was a devilish mm -hmm. ploy by the Soviet Union, that he was dispatched to, to the agency and to the U.S. to basically draw attention away from what Angleton was convinced was in fact a KGB connection to Oswald. So Angleton, who was all-powerful all at the time, decided not only that Nasenko was to be disbelieved, but that he had to be broken. So, so Nasenko is transported to the States, uh, basically imprisoned, in, you know, yeah. se secret prison, so to speak. In uh, the U.S. <laughs> yeah, in the U.S. It wasn't me in prison. And for three years was kept in this small room, mm. you know, endured endless interrogations, deprivations, uh, and while some of his story, his backstory, you know, turns out f fell apart, he never, he never, um, uh, he never varied about his about his claims about Oswald. Finally, in 1967, after three years of this, CIA leadership, Director Richard Helms, decided, look, enough was enough, um, and basically let Nasenko go. When I say let him go. I mean let him go to be in the custody of CIA. To resettle and try to try to put together the semblance of a normal life. So, flash forward uh, from '67 to 1978, which is where you I in. found him. And I had, I had been in the agency less than two years at the time, still trying to figure out what's going on. And I was dispatched by by my bosses to go see Nasenko, who, who of course had an entirely new name, identity, had a new wife. Defectors also seem not only shed their countries, but I found over the years shed their families in the old country when they come here and get remarried. Defector divorces is a whole nother uh, story. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was dispatched uh, to actually go down and see him in, in this uh, sleepy little southern.